21 stone Debbie Wood is morbidly obese and hasn't worked in four years. <laughs> she lives in a two-bedroomed council house and along with her husband gets £1,500 a month in benefits. You can't turn around and say to somebody, oh, because you're obese, it's your fault. It wasn't my fault the weight gate came on. Really? It's not your fault? Then whose fault is it? Who forced you to eat? You weren't born 300 pounds. Seriously, why do we let them get away with these kinds of arguments? If someone smokes three packs of cigarettes a day, we can say, hey man, you're destroying your health, and everyone cheers. But if someone eats 10 cheeseburgers for breakfast and you point out that it's maybe sort of a little unhealthy to do that, well then you're a terrible person who needs to be canceled. Never mind that these people are so troubled in terms of their health that they can't even stand for a few minutes. The council have specially modified Debbie's home to accommodate her needs. My occupational therapist had the council put in a wet room for me. I've had this specially adapted because uh, I can't stand for too long. This is actually the longest I've stood for a while. She can barely even stand. I'm so tired of this crap. At some point, we're all going to have to say that the people who promote health at every size are bad people. You cannot be healthy at 300 pounds. These people are horrid for enabling obese people by lying to them and saying that they are healthy. Because the reality is that obese people have all kinds of health problems and the ones promoting health at every size are preventing obese people from fixing themselves by telling them that they are healthy. Speaking of all the health problems that come with morbid obesity, let's talk about some of them. But first, if you like the content you see on this channel, then consider making a donation. Viewer support helps keep me independent and it helps fund the channel. Links to my PayPal, Patreon, and Subscribestar pages can all be found in the description. And also, don't forget to support me on Alt Tech. Links to my Odyssey channel and my Minds page can be found in the description as well. Alright, so these clips come from a documentary called 87 Stone. For those of you who don't know, one stone is 14 pounds. The documentary features three people. Debbie who is 43 and 295 pounds, Barry, who is 35 and 435 pounds, and Les, who is 45 and 490 pounds. I'll talk briefly about Les and Barry, but their stories aren't as interesting and there's not as much to learn from, so I'm mostly going to talk about Debbie. That being said, let's see what else Debbie has to go through. I have OCD, I have Othello syndrome, I have fibromyalgia, I have arthritis, I have facial palsy, and I have scoliosis. Some of those are psychological disorders, but arthritis, fibromyalgia, and facial palsy can all be related to obesity. That stuff, plus the fact that she can barely do basic things like standing up. Debbie's not the only one who has health problems from her weight. Let's hear from Les. In South Wales, 35 stone Les is also on disability benefit. Today, he's organising his medication for the week. These tramadol painkillers, this is gabapentin because of the diabetes. Omeprazole, I take about 17 tablets a day. Uh, if the pain is bad, I can take more of the painkillers. We have two things here related to obesity, which are diabetes and chronic pain. Also, later in the documentary, Les gets gout in one of his legs. He takes about 17 tablets a day of medication. I'm not sure if that's 17 tablets total, or if he was just talking about the painkillers. Either way, that's a lot of medication. Something that is not mentioned in this scene is that Les also has to use skin creams to keep himself from blistering or getting infections. Infections can be deadly, and they are something that all obese people of his size have to worry about. I imagine that Debbie has to worry about this as well. Also, much like Debbie, Les is in denial. You are what you are. You know, if you're meant to be fat, you'll be fat. If you're not, you're not. I don't want to be this size. I've never wanted to be this size. Right. You have no control over the situation. People just eat what they eat, and God decides who will be toned and muscular and who will be obese. Don't judge me unless you've walked a mile in my shoes. Les can't walk a mile in his own shoes because just hauling his 35 stone body around at home can be a struggle. Outside of the slight jabs that this documentary gives its subjects, I almost can't entirely blame them for saying things like this because for more than a decade, people in the media have been telling everyone that being overweight is not a problem. You cannot judge a person's health based on how they look. You cannot judge a person's health based on how much they weigh. Yes, you can. Stop lying to people. That was Cassie Ho, who runs a YouTube channel called Blogilates that has over 5 million subscribers. 
This channel is known for great things like promoting toning through low intensity high rep exercises, which is a myth. That's not how you get toned. Toning is achieved primarily through diet and loss of body fat, not through doing lots of low intensity arm waves. If you don't already have the muscle to look toned when your body fat is low, then you get it by doing high intensity resistance training along with eating surplus calories. But thank you, Cassie, for wasting tons of people's time by sending them down the wrong path. Let's see what she knows about dieting. Here's a tweet from last year. It says, It's been 365 days since I made the decision to get in the best shape of my life. Looking at this a little closer, on day one on the left, we see Cassie looking pretty good. On day 365 on the right, we see someone who is very malnourished and very underweight. Having an extremely low body fat is not healthy, especially for women. I'm surprised her dietitian let her get that thin. If Cassie thinks that being this thin is healthy, then I don't think she's qualified to talk about health as it relates to weight, which really is no different from any of the other people who promote health at every size. Getting back to the documentary, let's talk about addiction. If you are obese, especially if you are morbidly obese, then you are an addict. You are addicted to overeating. Rule number one of dealing with addicts. Addicts always lie. 21 Stone Debbie Wood and her husband receive $1,500 a month in benefits. I do get organic stuff, so I do pay out a bit uh, extra. This is a lie that obese people commonly tell. Addicts are always working to make their situation look better than it is, and the way tons of obese people do that is to say, I eat healthy all the time. Look, I'm eating a salad. Debbie states that she buys organic, and during the entire documentary, she tries to make it look like she's eating healthier than she actually is. Debbie, please. I was in the fitness industry. I'm not an idiot. I know how much someone of your size actually eats. First off, tons of things that are organic are also unhealthy. I've seen organic cookies, organic cakes, and organic ice cream. Buying expensive food with fewer pesticides and no antibiotics doesn't magically make it fewer calories. Second, I've said before that mentally unhealthy people don't know what's appropriate behavior, so when they pretend they are happy or they have good relationships, they always make mistakes. It's the same with people who are physically unhealthy. We see that Debbie here has a nice salad full of nutrient-deficient iceberg lettuce. And what is that? A Pepsi. What's the point in spending double the price for organic food if you're just going to drink Pepsi? Then, we can see that she has dumped a bunch of butter and mayonnaise all over her salad. Those toppings have a ton of calories in them. The butter, the dressing, and the soda have to be at least five to 600 calories, plus the lunch meat on the side, so in this case, we have a seven to 800 calorie meal. Here's a second example of a meal that actually looks correctly portioned, though you can see her dumping mayo all over her fries. Now, if she was only eating three meals a day, this would likely be a good portion for a 43-year-old woman, maybe slightly more than what she needs. But Debbie eats five to six times a day, and she barely exercises, so this is way too much food. Remember, she's on TV and is probably trying to look good for the cameras. This is what she thinks is healthy, and it's still too much. If you want to know how much people of her size actually eat, then watch My 600-Pound Life. My favorite thing about that show is its brutal honesty about obesity. This next part is where things get a little grotesque. In Britain, there seems to be a ton of state-provided care for people who are on disability. In Debbie's case, it's insane what she's given. First of all, Debbie and her husband get 1,500 pounds a month. That may not sound like much, but this is including the taxpayers paying for most of their major expenses, rent being a part of it. 21 Stone Debbie and her husband Steve get £1,500 a month in benefits. They pay £60 a week in rent. I did a Google search on the area that she lives in, and she pays about 30 to 50% of what she should be paying for a two-bedroom house. Thanks, taxpayers. In addition to this, Debbie's husband, 32-year-old Steve, gets paid 700 of that 1,500 pounds to take care of her. Although husband Steve is university educated and is fit enough to work, the state have paid him to be her full-time carer for the past year. Steve has a college degree and apparently is fully capable of working a decent job. Honestly, I don't believe that for a second. I think he got some useless degree and can't find work. The list goes on. Debbie also has a housekeeper who cleans her house three times a week. I find it very hard to do certain things because of my weight. 
One of the things 21 Stone Debbie finds hard is household chores. Luckily, though, the council have provided her a cleaner who comes round three times a week. Wait, so Steve gets paid to take care of her full time and they have a housekeeper as well? Why can't he clean the house? It's only two bedrooms and they don't have things like kids constantly making messes, so it should be easy. I'm surprised the housekeeper even needs multiple visits a week to keep the house cleaned. This is ridiculous. But we aren't done. Debbie also gets a new kitchen, entirely for free, all on the taxpayer's dime. And of course, she has tons of complaints about her free kitchen. She's also just had a brand new kitchen installed by the council, but she doesn't seem happy. The plastering is absolutely abysmal. Do you feel how rough that is? Out of 100, I would give it 60. So cracking that cupboard at the top lot. That, I think you'll find, is paint. Yeah. Hot stained. stuff. It was free. Stop complaining about a little scratch and a rough drywall job. If you want good contracting work, then pay for it yourself. Well, taking this next clip into account, you can see why Debbie is so entitled while spending other people's money. I've paid into my system. I'm entitled to get the stuff that we get. That's not the first time I've heard that excuse for abusing the welfare system. I don't believe for a second that Debbie paid in as much as she's getting out. Before she went on disability, she was a housekeeper and a psychic. There is no way she made any significant money as a psychic. Only the top con artists in that field actually make money, and that requires a kind of work ethic that I have not seen from Debbie. I'm just going to say that she was a housekeeper. I don't know what the salary of a housekeeper in the UK is, but it certainly does not pay enough for her, just on the percentage tax, to pull in 800 pounds a month, get half of your rent paid for, a free maid, several free remodels, and 700 pounds for her husband to take care of her. Be honest with yourself, you are not a net taxpayer in this case, and on that note, a big reason why I don't like welfare is because it forces taxpayers to enable people like Debbie. The truth about addiction is that if you let it play out long enough, Addicts, by their own doing, pretty much always lose the ability to support themselves. So the only thing allowing their addiction to be maintained is other people's support. If they lost that support, they would either be forced to change or suffer the consequences of their disease. If you actually want addicts to get better, then you have to be harsh in your thinking. Stop progressing their illness by enabling them. Since welfare or benefits pay removes all of the consequences of Debbie's poor eating habits, she has no reason to change. The whole idea of this documentary was to talk about people who were too overweight to work while maybe implying that they were trying to get back to a job. But the government has made it so comfortable for Debbie and her husband that they have zero reason to get off their asses and go work. If it wasn't for welfare, she wouldn't be able to afford the excessive amounts of food that she eats. Also, as their disease progresses, what addicts very often end up doing is they will just start abusing other people around them. Debbie certainly does that to her husband, Steve. And maintaining Debbie's extremely high standards isn't easy. Watch the eggs. Why are you putting them there? You know the door's going to swing back. And I'm going to stand here and hold the door because I'm in pain. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to hold the door. I don't know what I'm doing. In all honesty, this scene doesn't look that bad. I mean, it's not great. I certainly wouldn't want to be spoken to that way. But it's not hyper-abusive. The documentary kept insisting that Debbie was abusive, but didn't really do that great of a job displaying it, so I did some digging and found this Daily Mail article. It says that she checks her husband's phone and email and forbids him from looking at pictures and adverts featuring other women. That is quite intrusive, and she actually gets mad at him during the documentary for looking at a picture of a woman in a newspaper advertisement. Debbie and Steve also did an interview where it was revealed that she doesn't let him watch what he wants to watch on TV. The, the, the fact that you, you're not allowed to watch what you want on the TV it struck me as quite interesting. Well, that again, you see, I tend to watch sport like football. I'm a huge F1 fan. I'm a huge motorsport fan. I never used to watch much else anyway, to be honest with you. This guy is like a beaten animal. Yeah, well, my wife only lets me watch sports on TV, so I guess everything else sucks and my desires don't matter. She also said that if there's a woman on TV... He has to change the channel. <laughs> were you stopped from watching women on the television? I mean, you were even stopped from watching Anne Robinson. Uh -huh. <laughs> it is true, even commercials sometimes, you, you, you're told to switch over because it could be a woman shaving their legs in a commercial and it's a very yeah. pretty woman and you're not happy about that. But of course, in true abuser fashion, it's not a problem at all if she wants to look at other guys.
difference when between... we came in this morning and you were sitting over there uh -huh. we we're going to do our promo you said hi philip looking lovely today and i said well be careful otherwise he's going to feel jealous why can you do it and he can't i'll tell you what philip you look gorgeous wow that save after debbie got stumped came from a man who was very afraid of pissing her off and we still aren't done with debbie's abusive behavior when she is feeling self-conscious debbie makes steve take a lie detector test to prove his commitment to her this one was a response to something that happened on a walk they took, which was Debbie's first time leaving the house in eight months. We were talking about Mel B in the shop. I know what that. I want to know is, did you find her picture attractive? No. So you did find Mel B attractive then? Right. Unconvinced he's telling the truth about his feelings for Mel B, Debbie makes Stephen retake the test. Good God, Steve. You cannot be this much of a loser. At this point, you would be much better off alone. Not only is she super controlling from what she was willing to admit, but she's actually limiting Steve's growth. Steve says that he could not possibly get a job because he doesn't want Debbie worrying about who he might talk to at work or what women he might see. Me getting a job in the future is something I've thought about, but... With her mental condition, me getting a job, would she be wondering what I'm up to 24-7? Of course she doesn't want you working a job, because you might talk to people at work who will point out that she's abusive. A key strategy abusers use is to isolate you from other people who would criticize your situation or help you if you're in trouble. That's why Steve can't work, and that's why he has to be around her all the time, outside of when he gets her food. So now, for Steve, there is no upward mobility in his life. This is a problem because he is in his 30s, which is the part of your life where you need to work your ass off building your value and making investments so that you have something to live off when you get older. If this continues, Steve is going to have nothing in old age. This documentary came out a few years ago. Hopefully he left her. The woman already had two failed marriages before him. That should have been a red flag. But here's the really messed up part. Steve is out there doing actual work by going to the store three times a day, making her food, helping her bathe, and likely doing the dishes and the laundry. Together, they get 1,500 pounds a month. He gets 700 of it, and she gets 800 of it. She sits around all day, does no work, and the one who actually is doing work gets paid less, all while making sure she still has a good image. You know, we must be scum because we're on benefits, we don't keep a clean home, and we smoke and drink our money away. Yeah. I don't know about smoking and drinking, but you certainly aren't making good use of your time. While watching this documentary, I noticed a lot of Xbox going on in the background. I spent the whole time thinking, I bet they are essentially playing video games all day. Well, it turns out, I was right. Being unemployed gives Debbie and her husband and carer Steve plenty of time to indulge in their favorite hobby, gaming. In terms of how many hours a day we spend playing games or whatever, I think it's probably more than half the day. More than half the day? Like every day? You spend more than half of every day playing video games? I can see maybe doing that once in a while or maybe on the weekend, but every day? Let's say you sleep for eight hours and are awake for 18. That's eight hours a day or more of playing video games. Do you have any idea how much time you're wasting? Look at it this way. Debbie has been on disability for four years. If she just spent one hour a day, maybe two hours a day, building a skill, in four years' time, she could be well into a decent job. But instead, she's done nothing with that time. I think people vastly underestimate how much you can learn just by dedicating small bits of your day to self-improvement. Ten pages of a book every day can change your life if you read the right books. These days, you don't even have to read them. You can just listen to books while you're driving, making meals, or doing housework. Mix that in with a few minutes of building skills every day, maybe with memorization tools like Brainscape, and in four years, you'll become a different person. And what's 10 pages, like 20 minutes of reading? Certainly, they both could take 20 minutes out of their busy Xbox schedule to better their situation. Well, maybe that's asking too much. Debbie already feels overworked. I'm probably going to have a bit of a nap at the moment because I'm really tired. This has been a long day for me. I'm feeling a bit strained and then I'll probably go do some gaming and maybe have a sip of cider if I may feel up to it. Wow, I had no idea that sitting around all day playing Xbox was so difficult. 
Also notice that this is very typical with addicts. Typically, addicts have multiple addictions. In her case, it would be video games and overeating. But I now don't feel as bad for Steve. He also is a video game addict and is complicit in this because he is just sitting around wasting time like Debbie is. These people should not be getting any support from taxpayers at all because all it's doing is making them worse. The only good thing I saw Debbie do was buy a treadmill that she uses for 10 minutes every other day. That's a great start, but as far as being able to get back to her flourishing career as a psychic, I don't see any plans of that. A Daily Mail article said that she was trying to make it as a model, but that is not a job. Modeling is not a job unless you are actually making a good amount of money. Until that happens, you need a side hustle. She currently has no side hustle, and she doesn't appear to be making a real effort to lose the weight, so it looks like she's not actually trying to get back to work. This all goes back to the extreme denial that obesity is a problem. You can find examples of this everywhere. Here's one from that blog Blogilates video that I clipped earlier. The participants were supposed to match up with someone who they thought was a similar weight. This is what one of them said after they were paired up and they were going over BMI. I mean, I personally don't consider myself, like, obese. I mean, I know I'm not healthy. You don't consider yourself obese? Your body fat is 44%. That's morbid obesity. At least she said she wasn't healthy. That's a start, but she is still in denial of how severe her problem is. I'm not saying this to make fun of her. I'm saying this in the hopes that her addiction doesn't cut her life short in her 40s. Someone has to help her break past her denial by saying that she has a problem. And that's not hate speech. It's showing that you care. If you are too afraid to help someone because you're worried about offending them, then you don't actually care about them. Here's the crappy thing, though. Moving past denial is just the first step to getting past an addiction. Even if you want to get better, it's still very difficult to make a change. This is something that the two other guys in the documentary had a problem with. Les wants to get back to work, and despite the denial that I showed earlier, by the end of the documentary, he does appear to somewhat recognize that his weight is a problem. But he can't get back to work because he doesn't know how to control his diet. I know the operation isn't the answer to everything, but uh, with my mobility and how I'm getting worse, Dr. Abobi thinks it's one of the best things they could do for me at the moment. If I get that, my life could turn around and hopefully I get back into work and then stop being a massive drain on NHS resources. Barry, who I pretty much haven't shown at all, was like the golden child of this documentary. He wanted to find a job and get back to work far more than the other two did. If there is anyone who deserves a little extra help, it's him. In London, 31 Stone Barry can't afford his own treadmill. He receives £73 job seekers allowance a week, but it's something he wants to change. I'm so desperate to get back to work. Um, the sooner I get back working, the better. Unfortunately, Barry finds out that even if you do want to make changes, it is still incredibly difficult to follow through, and many things will hold you back. After an interview and assessment, Barry is told he's not got the job due to failing the maths test. I'm choked. I really wanted a job like this. Hopefully, by losing weight, um, get myself back into work and fully fit. Not every fat person is someone who's going to sit down and do no work all day. He failed his weight test, and you can't really blame the employers. Obesity is a self-inflicted problem, and that problem is going to cost whoever employs you. I don't know if in Britain the employers have to pay more into the medical system if a worker is obese, but they are certainly going to have to pay the cost of you getting sick or injured more often. They are also going to have to deal with someone who is less physically in shape and might not be able to work as hard or have as much energy as someone who is thin. In America, it gets really bad because the law requires businesses with a certain number of employees to pay health care costs if they are full-time labor. So of course weight is a problem. The sad thing for Barry is that it's going to take him at least two years to lose that weight, and until he does, he probably is going to have a very difficult time finding work. But I think that a part of the reason that people have trouble overcoming addiction is because they don't understand why it's so hard to change. So what they end up doing is not making a change at all, or they quit cold turkey and fail because it's too difficult, or they trade one addiction for another, like a chronic smoker who quits and starts gaining a bunch of weight from overeating. I think something that describes why an addiction is so hard to get over is the story The Lord of the Rings. Stories are always set around metaphors, and the metaphors used in The Lord of the Rings are designed to get you to understand addiction. If you watch closely, the true villain in that story is not the evil tyrant Sauron. The true villain is the ring. 
I actually didn't notice that last part when I first watched the movies. A friend had to point that out. Much like a drug, the ring has people constantly fixated on it. They are addicted to the power it could give them, but sadly, all it does is destroy the lives of the people who use it, and each time it's used, the consequences get worse. Tolkien and Peter Jackson get this metaphor right, even down to the smallest details. When you hold the ring, it whispers to you like voices in your head that tell an addict to use. Come on, man. It's your birthday. It's a special occasion, so of course you can drink. Addicts will play all kinds of mental games with themselves and think of all sorts of excuses to use. One more thing. When Bilbo meets Frodo before his death, he gets nostalgic about the ring like a recovering alcoholic does with drinking. Remember all the good times you had when you drank? What if you just had one beer for old times' sake? Listen to one of Bilbo's last lines in the movies. It has the same sentiment. Frodo, is there any chance of seeing that old ring of mine again? Sorry, Uncle. I'm afraid I lost it. Did you? Should I have held it one last time? If you know about addiction, then you know it won't just be one last time. Your use of the drug will reactivate the disease and you'll spiral out of control again. If you are an addict, once you get off the drug, you can never have it again. In the case of overeating, yes, you have to eat, but you never again allow yourself to have ridiculous portion sizes or you will reactivate your disease. These are all things that addicts go through when they try to get clean, and the reason it's so difficult to remove yourself from an addiction is because your own mind will constantly attack you for not using. In Tolkien's story, the greatest enemy is not the evil overlord. The greatest enemy is your own mind, addiction being a facet of that, and after studying psychology for many years, I completely agree. The most prevalent problem in society is addiction. That runs all the way up and down the chain. Tons if not the vast majority of people in power are money addicts and or power addicts who are constantly craving more and more, even if it causes them to do things that are against their own best interest. Corrupting a system hurts everyone, even rich people and even politicians who are evil. As for how it affects people personally, I think that's much more obvious. Addiction will destroy your life, kill your dreams, and ruin the lives of people around you. Addiction is a tough problem to beat, but it is possible to win. The way you do that is you recognize that the addiction is just a symptom and what is actually causing you to use or overeat are other life problems that are stressing you out. Barry, the golden child from the documentary, actually says this. I've always been a, a big, large person, but I put on about five, six stone, and, uh, and that was due to being depressed of losing my job. If you recognize that stress from life problems is what's actually causing you to eat too much, then you have something you can work with. If you start fixing those problems, you'll find yourself turning to food to manage your stress a lot less. You'll also find that if you overeat all the time and you switch to a properly portioned diet for a while, you'll stop getting super hungry throughout your day. The first week or two of portion control really sucks because your body will constantly bug you to eat. If you can make it through that, the constant hunger will go away, and from there, you just have to worry about the psychological issues. The last part of this is that you cannot get rid of an addiction by yourself. You cure it by forming positive relationships with other people. That can be through a therapist, or it can be through a 12-step or 12-step related program, or, seeing how people are these days, a lot of it might just be about learning how to make new friends. Some people are succumbing to addiction simply because they don't have anyone to talk to or because nobody cares about them. Not having friends is unacceptable. You need to go out into public to places where people have similar interests to you, start talking to them, and learn how to be socially acceptable so that people want to be around you. But the important thing is that there has to be something in your life that creates positive human connection or you will not get better. Also, you'll relapse tons of times before you actually recover from the disease. Relapse is a part of recovery. If that happens, get right back on the horse as soon as possible. Don't let a bad day turn into a bad month or a bad year. But with that said, I think that's enough for this video. So if you liked it, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new, comment and share. If you would like to support this channel, then you can do so with PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar, 
You can find all of those links in the description. Last, don't forget to check me out on Odyssey and Minds.com. You can also find those links in the description. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.